am Jerry DeVecchio, a member of ARCS. I want to welcome all of you, really. Um, ARCS members, friends, family, and for this year's, for to this year's Frontiers in Science event, <clears throat> presented by the Northern California chapter of ARCS. For the benefit of our guests, uh, we are a national volunteer organization of 50 plus years that generously funds graduate science research students. Our Northern California chapter works with San Francisco State University, Stanford, and the UC campuses at Berkeley, Davis, San Francisco, and Santa Cruz. <clears throat> Your interest and response has been amazing and truly indicate our shared interest in how we are going to feed ourselves in the future. After all, <clears throat> the one thing we all do is eat, not only to survive, but for the pleasure that is intrinsic in the process, literally from the earth to the table. Today's question is, how can we create resilient food and agriculture systems in the face of climate change and many other shocks? How do we go forward to keep our planet viable? To address this topic, we have four outstandingly qualified authorities. Sabella Krauss, who is head of SAGE. It's a hands-on program for sustainable agricultural uh, education. She is going to moderate the following discussion with our own Alice Waters, food activist and founder of both Shape and East Restaurant and the Edible Schoolyard Project. <clears throat> Alice, Sabella, and I go back many years in the food world. I was food editor, food and wine editor at Sunset Magazine when Alice started Chez Panisse a half a century ago. And Sabella was also part of the Chez Panisse team. I regret that two of our speakers fell victim to COVID and are currently devoted to recovery. Joshua Veers and Gail Finstro. I'm extremely appreciative that they have backup experts who agreed to step in literally within the last few hours. <clears throat> Joshua is um, UC Merced's director of CITES. Yeah, so I don't want him to not sign him. And do you want to put the thing with it? Or can you lock, mute yourself, please, whoever came on? Um, uh, so anyway, CITES, that's the Center for Information Technology Research, and he's also with Water Resources. Dr. Lee Bernacki, program director for CITES, which also includes smart farming, is taking over Joshua's discussion. Gail is at uh, UC Davis, I think, and director of uh, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, which includes natural resources. Uh, it's now a statewide program. Sonia Brute is the associate director coordinator for agriculture and environment. Sonia's focus includes ag production and biological diversification. I kept cutting out. It's just nuts. Please, please mute yourself. Yeah, please mute. Um, <clears throat> golly. Uh, anyway, Sony deals with production um, and bio biological diversification of our farming systems and much more. Without Sabella's wise guidance and help, we wouldn't be here today. Thank you, Sabella. And take it on. It's all yours. All right. Jerry, thank you so much. And let me add my welcome to all of you here this evening. So we're here to discuss feeding ourselves in the future. How can we create resilient food and ag systems in the face of climate change and other shocks? Clearly, climate change and other shocks are very much here. And daily, we're all learning the lessons of what it means to be resilient, both individually and collectively. And similarly, individually and collectively, we're taking action to increase our resilience and also our equity. I was certainly heartened, like many of you here, I am sure, to hear in Governor Newsom's budget about his priorities and the significant investments being proposed for climate, education, sustainable agriculture, and workforce development, all elements of, a, of sustainable food systems. The panelists with us this evening are deeply informed activists and aspirational thinkers and doers who are advancing key pillars of resilient food systems. I'll just give brief further introduction, introduction. to, to uh, a Whoops, I'm hearing an echo for some reason. Is that better? To, to our panelists. Alice, chef, author, food activist, and the founder of Shape and East Restaurant in Berkeley, 
and she's been a champion of local sustainable agriculture for over four decades. In 1995, she founded the Edible Schoolyard Project, which advocates for free regenerative organic school lunch for all children and a sustainable food curriculum in every public school. Sonia, Associate Director of it's the UC Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, as Jerry said, can coordinates the agriculture and environment theme. And her particular focus is integrating social science and agroecological perspectives into her work. She's also taken a leading role in spearheading professional development programs geared toward increasing the capacity of extension professionals to engage more radically and with, with more radically, racially, excuse me, and probably radically and culturally diverse and traditionally underserved stakeholders. Uh, Lee Bernaki um, is uh, with UC Merced and is program director for the Center for Information Technology Research and the Interests of Society. Lee builds partnerships with community, industry, and educational leaders to develop ag food tech sustainability and diversity in tech solutions. Um, uh, Lee also serves the San Joaquin Valley through innovative programs to prepare students for the future of work and rewarding career opportunities in the region. So without further ado, let's please welcome our three distinguished panelists. Um, I heard the claps, but even though you're muted. So we're gonna, the format for the program today is as follows. Um, we're going to first ask each of our three panelists sort of the same question, which I'll answer with their own perspective. And then there'll be some discussion amongst us. And then there'll be some specific examples um, that each uh, panelist will give. And then there'll be room towards the end for questions from all of you. And we'll ask you please to put your questions in the chat so you can put them in the chat at any time. And we'll be asking those closer towards, um, towards six o'clock. So to start out, um, Alice and Lee and Sonia, we'd like you to answer two questions. And in that order, Alice, Lee, Sonia, what are the factors that are most impacting our current food system? And what are the most important things that we can do to change that directory to a, to a food system that is more sustainable and resilient? And as you talk, any examples that you can give that especially um, relate to, to students and, and student and education would be terrific. So please, Alice. Well, I have to begin with climate. I'm terribly, terribly worried about climate, as we all are. It's inevitable and it's coming. And we have to think of a way to address it that can happen right now. So I look to see what could reach every person. And I came to the conclusion it's that an arc education, seminar. Please remember okay? to come in. Thank you. Go ahead, Alice. <laughs> that education is that place. Every child goes to school or should. So that is the place that we can teach the values that we need to live on this planet together. And then I, of course, thought about food because we've been doing an intervention, if you want to call it that, at the edible schoolyard here in Berkeley at a middle school for the last 25 years. And Sabella, you were there at the very beginning of that. And I just saw that Delaine Easton is in the audience here today. And she was there at the very beginning as well. But the project has really proven because there are a thousand students at that school that speak 22 different languages at home. And it's a middle school. And we are using a garden classroom and a kitchen classroom to teach all of the academic subjects. Well, no surprise that the students learn them easily and love to be cooking for a history class and eating the food of that country 
and working in the garden classroom and at the same time experiencing the beauty of nature. So I have been convinced that education is that place. And if we could think about school lunch, which has been owned by the corporate industrial food system for a very long time. And what if they decided in Washington <laughs> to change that school lunch and, and ask that all schools purchase local regenerative organic food? Just imagine what an economic stimulus it could be for that particular state. So I have been, of course, focused in the state of California and thinking about K through 12 for a very long time, but realizing that K through 12 is 45th in terms of academic achievement in this country, if you can imagine. So there's not even enough money to pay teachers or to rebuild cafeterias. But there is this possibility that the University of California could make a path for K through 12. What if they change their procurement of food? What if they decided to go directly, directly to the farms and the ranches and the fishermen and bought like we do at Chez Penny's for the last almost 50 years? I mean, Sibeli set up that system. You went and foraged around California to find the farmers. And then we directly connected to them so that they would get all the money. And of course, Bob Kennard, our maiden farmer, takes all of the scraps from Chez Panisse and puts them back in the ground, pulling down the carbon into the ground where it belongs. So for me, this is the most delicious and easily accomplished idea because it's taking the money from the industrial food system and supporting the people who are taking care of the land for the future. And I'll tell you, the values come right through the kitchen door, right came in with Bob Kennard. He was a regenerative farmer before I even heard about what that word meant. And he came right in there. So I know that with an incredible collaboration in the state of California, with all of these organizations that are 50 years old now, the NRDC, the CCOF, CAF, um, Patagonia, there are many, many, many more that could help to make this real for the University of California. So I am incredibly hopeful by this delicious revolution idea. And we have communicated with the powers that be. And we really feel like we could add food to the carbon neutrality initiative that's already in place for 2025. That was started by Janet Napolitano when she was president of the University of California. But food is that place that when you eat ripe food, when you eat a little Kishu Mandarin at this time of the year, mm. you're won over. <laughs> you just say yes. And you can only eat ripe food if it's locally produced. And I'd just like to say, just as an end thought, 
that we used to do this in this country as recently as 60 years ago. We only ate local food. I lived in New Jersey, so I knew what it was like. Only corn and tomatoes in the summer, applesauce and, and winter greens in the winter. But we sometimes had a citrus from Florida, but that was it. Never food brought in from around the world, except maybe coffee and tea. And in that short period of time, we have changed the whole food system. And of course, during this pandemic, we've seen the disgraceful and immoral operations of the industrial food system. I mean, it's really shocking that we don't take advantage of this moment in time and get to Vilsack and get him to make the right decisions about school lunch. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Alice, thank you. Thank you so very much. Your remarks for all you have done here for these last 50 plus years yourself and to inspire so many others. Lee, I'm going to ask you to speak next you know, from the perspective of your work in, in UC Merced and the Central Valley. What do you see the most important factors being to shift the tra trajectory of the food system and agriculture system? Thank you so much for the opportunity to share uh, our perspective from UC Merced and uh, we focus on a lot of diversity and technology and in the food system, we have a lot of students who are coming from families who worked in the fields or who haven't had enough food at their homes and some of our students are suffering. Um, but we are working to overcome a lot of that at University of California Merced. And uh, I just wanna thank Dr. Marjorie Zatz, our talented vice chancellor for research, who's done a tremendous amount to elevate science and scientists, especially women and people of color here. Um, Elena. Sorry, the, oh. I guess I was muted, I'm sorry. You're fine. You're fine. Please go okay. on. Okay. Um, uh, I also have to entirely agree with everything that Miss Waters has said. Um, it's a travesty that we don't have enough food in the richest country in the world. And uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, where we grow 40% of the nation's fruit, nuts, and vegetables, a lot of people go grow hungry or go hungry. And so uh, we're trying to work on those issues. Um, there were glimmers of hope during the pandemic and increased interest in food, perhaps. People were cooking at home. Seed catalogs could not provide enough seeds for home gardeners. Um, people built chicken coops, they baked bread, they ate food again, um, but that was a position of privilege, of course. And so um, equity is another big issue for the food system. Um, in terms of climate change, which is one of UC Merced's strengths, um, I'm most worried about uh, how we can bring down our emissions and uh, mitigate for climate change using agricultural land, which is 40% of UC or of uh, American land is devoted to agriculture. That's a huge area where we could be storing much more carbon, um, applying some of the uh, manure or even night soil as Dr. Becca Riles does uh, to improve the not only the soil, but storing that carbon and getting it out of the atmosphere. Um, I mean, I'm concerned about uh, hotter, drier, summers for the San Joaquin Valley, we had 64 days over 100 degrees. And that's just not tenable to grow uh, the kind of crops we need. I mean, I didn't have tomatoes uh, that were able to stay on the vine until uh, October. So um, I think we need to find the people to help us uh, adapt the fastest. And it might not always be the people we think it is. So some of my research is identifying 
who are the change makers of climate change in the agri agricultural and food system. For example, it's it might be the people who are selling petrochemicals and you wouldn't think they would have a vested interest, but they manage great areas of the land. So um, crop consultants being one of the people that we're leaning on and people like Sonia who are very well trusted by uh, our food producers and processors. Lastly, with respect to climate change, a bit of hope uh, and I second Governor Newsom's efforts to electric by uh, California vehicles. And I hope that we can put all electric F-150s on every farm, that we can capture all of the uh, dairy manure and turn that into a biogas and generate with solar so that farms become self-sustaining from the energy produced on their own farm. Um, I, we recently funded through the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society a small seed grant to work on electrifying tractors. What kinds of crops are suitable for running on electric tractors? What kinds of, um, how, how often would they have to run? What's the optimization for uh, that ramp up to an all electric agricultural system? Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, and uh, this is our research focus, it, uh, one of the projects that was funded by USDA, it's called Secure Water Future. And um, we were given $10 million to take apart the agricultural system layer by layer, scale by scale, to look at where can we conserve more water? Where can we trade water so that it doesn't go to the most lucrative crop, but maybe to the most needed place? <laughs> Um, and this is a uh, southwestern U.S. wide project that's trying to do more crop for drop and more equity and sustainability within that water system. So um, those are the factors I see us uh, contributing to an agricultural system, and it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> <coughs> Lee, thank you so much. That's um, many, many important pieces of work that you're doing there. Um, We'll hear now from Sonia. Um, UC Sarup is a statewide program, and and Sonia, I'd ask you similarly. You know, what do you see are the most important factors that are impacting the food system, and most importantly, um, what can we do to change that trajectory, for, to make it more resilient, positive, and equitable? Yes, thank you so much, um, Jerry. I could we can have those slides. Maybe if you could start those. Um, and while she's getting the slides up, I want to kind of say that I think one of the big themes that cuts across all of this, um, and I'll come back to it later, is understanding and implementing the true cost of food. And so by that, I mean, you know, understanding the environmental impacts, which takes a lot of science, understanding the methods to, um, on environmental and social impacts and understanding the methods we can use to reduce yeah. those impacts. Um, excuse me, um, I'm not sure the slides uh, are- Yeah, I don't, it's too big. Here. <laughs> Let's take a second to see. If you click onto the slideshow version, perhaps. It's theirs. There you go, slideshow. And then I think you need to maybe increase the size of your screen, your screen here. There we go. That's better. Thank you so much. Please go um, on. So, yes. so I was talking about the true cost of food and you know understanding it, which takes a lot of science, and then um, recognizing the importance of what it takes to actually produce our food and distribute it in a way that doesn't have all these negative impacts and then implementing that. Um, so hang on to that idea and let me talk a little bit about all the different range of work that we do in the UC Sarah program. Um, and like Sabella said, we are a statewide program and we're with the UC Agriculture and Natural Resources, which is the land grant arm of the UC system. So it includes all the cooperative extension people throughout all the counties, as well as certain people on campuses and statewide programs like us. 
So next slide, please. So the challenges that we work on are varied. Um, we look at the economic strain on farms and food businesses. And you know this goes back to the idea that in our mainstream food system, farmers are often caught between very consolidated input suppliers, like the companies they buy their fertilizers and pesticides from and their seeds. Um, and they don't have a lot of control over those prices. And then on the other end of it, they have to sell their food at a very cheap rate. And so they're kind of caught in between. And so our program is looking at how do we create systems that take farmers you know, out of that conundrum and into something where they get the value for what they are producing um, and, and can afford to be farming. Um, and like the others um, before me, Alice and Lee, I'm very concerned about climate change as a huge factor that's just affecting everything, the production side of it, as well as distribution, um, wildfires that disrupt supply chains and all of that. So um, that's a big issue. And then overall um, inequities in the food system that have built up over time, for example, um, the health of farm workers is some of the poorest in our communities um, and just a lot of inequities. Uh, and that's what we're trying to address as well. Also with different racial groups that don't have access to the same resources if they're trying to farm, they don't have as easy access to land and things like that. Um, so next slide. So what we do, our mission is basically twofold, it's to support farmers and ranchers working to develop more sustainable production and also I would say marketing practices. And on the other end, we also work with communities to help them to build healthy regional food systems. Um, yeah, next slide, please. And so we do those things in a number of key ways. One is um, the area I work on is looking at uh, different ways to implement more renewable agricultural systems. And one of those uh, key components of that is bringing more bio biological diversity into our farming systems. Um, so I've had a project looking at hedgerows and how we might actually make hedgerows productive assets by farming. Oops, we can go back to the other slide. I think we jumped ahead. Thanks. Um, how we can make hedgerows part of the productive agro landscape by um, farming the hedgerows. Uh, for example, we have this wonderful native plant that is very drought adapted uh, and adapted to a lot of microclimates in California. It's the blue elderberry and it has a long history of use by Native Americans and uh, we've had a project looking at what if farmers planted that and, and worked to make products from those berries. And they're in great demand now. There's a huge market for elderberry products. And um, that's a way to maybe incentivize more hedgerow planting and using native plants, no less, that are adapted to our climates and maybe resilient to the changing climate also. So that's one thing we do. Um, we're looking at resilient food supply chains um, and so that has to do with, well, elderberry is another example of that. So we looked also at the marketing opportunities for elderberry products and what does it take to market successfully so that once you have this sustainably produced product that you also have a market for it. That's going back to kind of, uh, you know, implementing the true cost of food. If you are doing something in a sustainable way, is there a market that will support that? And then um, Gail Feenstra, my colleague, does a lot of work on regional food systems in a policy perspective. Um, there's been county level food assessments, food system assessments, where they look at um, you know, where is food produced, who has access to it, what numbers of people and where are food insecure, and a range of indicators like that. Um, to help the food policy councils in different areas to, to implement changes and to know what changes need to be implemented. And then we're also 
in the last few years, we've really tried to beef up our efforts on increasing equity and justice in the food system. And uh, we focused initially a lot on professional development for extension people. So for our colleagues around the UC system and in other agencies like uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service and others um, so that we can better reach um, farmers of color and uh, farm workers and really value them for their knowledge and for the, the resources that they can provide to the system, which are really undervalued in our mainstream system right now. Uh, next slide. So um, I think I already talked, this is a little more on detail level, but I already talked about some of this, um, how we are supporting farmers and ranchers with more biological diversity in their farming practices. Um, we've had different projects looking at nutrient management and uh, looking at the footprints like the carbon footprint or climate footprint of our food production and supply chains. And then on the other end of the spectrum, looking at, like I said, the county level food system assessments, uh, food hubs is something my colleagues are working on, how to strengthen those. So again, small producers with um, resilient production practices can have a place where they can market their products. And finally, I think I'll end with this next slide. Yeah, so where to next? Um, again, I think to get to kind of harnessing the ecosystem processes for helping our farming systems to adapt to climate change and other environmental stresses, we need to re-diversify our farming systems and also our supply chains. Um, and looking a lot at racial and social justice in our systems. And, you know, we do a lot of this. I mean, we are a science-based organization and we base um, our work on sound science from our colleagues, but really it takes more than just doing the science. It's all about networking with the right people reaching out and organizing communities, which include scientists and practitioners like farmers and food businesses and getting them to work together. Um, that's kind of the focus that we take. And I think I'll end that there for now. Sonia, thank you so very much. I can just attest that elderberries grow like crazy, certainly in the Bay Area. I think we had elderberries, we just popped in there and all of a sudden they were 15 feet tall in a year in our backyard. So they are, huge, they are yeah. uh, absolutely. So, <laughs> so thank you all. I see many themes across what you've all said. I've got questions, but do you, first of all, do you have questions for each other? Uh, I have a question. Um, um, why, why aren't we using the purchasing power of the University of California to create the opportunity for the people who are doing the right thing to provide the food? We can put people in business all around the state. We could use the lands of the University of California to grow the food and just think of how much food they need. And if they decentralize, why wouldn't that be the most desirable way to bring all of these ideas into reality? Couldn't we collaborate? <laughs> well, Sonia, maybe, I'm sorry, excuse me, Lee, I will throw that out to you since you are at a UC and you're in the middle of developing an experimental smart farm and I know you're very concerned about the health and well-being of your students. So um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, it's something that we should do and that we need to extend your edible schoolyards and edible education, not just K-12, but uh, K through whatever grade I'm in now, 36. Um, <laughs> so that we can all continue to learn and engage with our food system and produce food, delight in food, share together. I mean, the saddest thing in the pandemic was uh, students 
who are out on our campus, which is a bit out of town and um, could be perceived as a food desert because students don't have access to a lot of food there um, at a reasonable cost, is that they had to eat alone and all the food is carry out right now to protect from COVID. Um, when we don't get to eat together, I think that's a travesty. But um, this idea of the experimental smart farm was birthed during the pandemic. It's uh, UC Merced investing in 40 acres on its campus to produce food, um, mm -hmm. produce research as well, and produce the experience of studying and engaging with food, creating a recreation space for students and faculty. Um, I work with a lot of industry partners and uh, they want their student, they want their interns and their future employees to be familiar with the agricultural system. And uh, they've asked us to invest in that. So we take students to um, Pajeo Lavender Farm. We take them to Hillmar Cheese. We take them to uh, Morning Star Tomatoes so that they get to see the nuts and bolts of the current industrial food system and also some smaller operations um, throughout the San Joaquin Valley. Um, we're, we're really interested in providing more opportunities for students to work in agricultural problems. Um, for example, I have a student who majored in computer science. Recording and now, in progress and has now uh, received his degree and will be working at Gallo Farms, which is one of the biggest wineries in, in the country. So um, we're trying to prepare them and make it interesting for students to work in agriculture. A lot of them wanna get away from it or they don't see a future in it. So um, I guess that's kind of my question for you and Sonia, Alice, is, um, how do I help my students see a future in this ancient profession of producing <laughs> food and keep it spicy or interesting or, or let them know that there, there is a career for them there? Well, I really feel like it's the powers that be at the University of California. They could direct the purchasing of all the food that students eat to the people who take care of the land and take care of their farm workers. And it's a gigantic budget. <laughs> so it would put everybody who wanted to work in farming or producing, whether it's making tortillas or whether whatever aspect of food production, there could be this opportunity to make a really good living, to have an absolutely reliable buyer. Now that's one of the key things for people wanting to go into farming. They, even the ones who sell at the farmer's market don't know that they're going to sell everything. But if we buy directly from them and say, we'll buy everything you grow, that gives them the encouragement and we'll buy it at the real cost. We're not asking for a wholesale price. We're, we're, we're going to buy it at the real cost. And that, when we said that we would do that at Chopinese, everybody wanted to sell to us. I mean, Sibella couldn't handle all the people who wanted to come. <laughs> I mean, we probably got 80 people in in one season who wanted to, to bring us things because that is so unusual. It's like um, to, to have that reliable buyer is critical and to have the real cost that it takes to run a business or to take care of everybody who's working for you. Mm -hmm. So it addresses absolutely equity because it's, it's looking for people who, and, and even giving them land to farm because we have all of these places that are part of the university system. So we have the opportunity to give the land 
for people to farm and grow food for students at the University of California. But if we could make it here, we could show the rest of the country and the world. <laughs> I'm convinced. I was in Berkeley in the 60s, so <laughs> I know. Oh my, food, and revolution. food and revolution there. <laughs> I know my colleague Gail is working with the UC Davis Health System and a chef there to do just that on some project. Oh, I don't know a lot of details about it, but and somebody wrote in the chat, UC Davis does do local sourcing to some uh, extent as well. Well, UC Davis wants me to open an institute for regenerative ag and, and edible education. And so I'm about to raise money for it but we'll be able to teach people how to buy directly from farms, how to make menus that are affordable and nutritious. We'll be able to, to really teach about cooking in a very different way, uh, where it's almost a regenerative thinking instead of this pyramid of chef at the top, and all of these workers at the bottom. We need to think about how kitchens could be reimagined so that they could really nourish everybody who works in the kitchen. Thank you, Alice. I, I would, I'm sure everyone would love to hear more about your ideas for this institute um, and this call and, and in subsequent um, communications. You know, I, I think one of the sort of frictions perhaps um, in here is that for many people, when we think about what do we need to do to our food system, to our agriculture, the first thing that comes to mind is agri-tech and all the tech solutions, whether it is um, things that help water growers be more water efficient or understand where disease is coming out in the corner of a crop, or it's also applied to food, meat, meat replacements and that sort of thing. So, you know, um, Lee, Sonia, do, do you want to sort of start in? I mean, um, how, where, where is there, um, what is the continuum or the, or the mixing place for regenerative agriculture, you know, direct basic food from, from farms delivered directly to customers and, and a lot of the developments in, in multiple dimensions of food tech and uh, agricultural technology? Yeah, I mean, I can maybe just start by saying it's it's something I've thought about a lot that there's sort of, like you said, there's a little bit of a tension there. And I think we need to be able to kind of hold different approaches in our minds at the same time, and which is challenging. Sometimes we want to be like in this camp or that camp, but that doesn't always kind of get the best bang for the buck and, and solve our issues. But um, yeah, on the one hand, I'm really at the moment trying to work on restoring agroecosystems, you know, in their entirety and having those function for themselves so we can reduce the amount of inputs that farmers need. And like, for example, I've talked to some farmers like in orchard crops, for example, it's like a really important principle that you always have to monitor for pests because that's how you will know when to apply pesticides so that you don't apply too many. And it is, it's a good practice that's recommended. And I agree that needs to be done, but there are some growers who just have their system down. It's working and they say, I don't need to monitor anymore because I don't, I never have this pest problem because my whole ecology is working to keep that in check. So it's, you know, that's the one end that I'd like to see more of. On the other hand, there's, the precision agriculture approach, which is all about, you know, monitoring everything really carefully so that you know exactly where, you know, which plant, individual plant needs more nitrogen fertilizer and which don't. So you just apply where you need. And that could really cut down on your input use also. And I think, you know, some, the answer is probably somewhere in between where there are, there are benefits of each and we have to figure out, I think, Think how to maybe merge those approaches or when is which one most needed. Um, and yeah, I don't know if Lee wants to add something, but it's it's an interesting I mean, question. I mean, it, you know, because there you are with the Fresno to Merced 
Future of Food Innovation Initiative um, right at your doorstep. And so a lot of people are thinking of what is the future of food innovation? It sounds, you know, science fiction on one side, or is it really going back to more basic understanding of agroecosystems? I'll just add, um, I, th I think it's, we have to think about these things differently as well, Sonia, that um, it's a different approach. It's not ag as we know it in the Silicon Valley or tech as we know it in the uh, in the Silicon Valley, sorry, food, ag in the San Joaquin Valley and Silicon Valley yeah. tech. Um, it's different and we intentionally put food right in the middle as the most important part. It's ag food tech with an interest in improving our society. I mean, I'm the first person to say, I don't know about this technology. I'm a hippie vegetarian who grew up in a town without a stoplight. So I'm a little bit wary of um, all these interventions in our aggregate system and who's going to make the money off of it. And um, how can we increase transparency of on-farm data or um, make sure that people are paid for their farm data so that they do have an interest in producing this information. Um, right now, companies own a lot of the data that's produced by the farmers and they don't get to see it. So, um, uh, but I do think technology at this point, it's finally reached the stage where technology allows us to do sustainable agriculture at the scale we need to, to feed 10 billion people especially in a hotter world. I've been persuaded by my colleagues at UC Merced that it's both a spatial benefit and a temporal benefit to allow us to continue to grow over time and adapt. Um, and that technology is maybe not what we think of. Um, it, of course, it's instrumenting the farm with um, more accounting than anyone could ever use in a lifetime. But right now, the first thing we did was put in soil moisture probes and you can get a stream of that data right to the cloud um, right now. Um, that was the first thing we did. Um, but people like Gordon Bennett is inventing ways to use um, pheromones from pests rather than pesticides. Uh, Yang Quan Chen, who's a professor of mechatronics is moving in that precision agriculture space where a UAV or a drone per spot treats uh, pieces of a farm rather than wholesale spraying it with a crop duster and risking that crop duster's life. So it's changing those jobs from crop duster to drone pilot from uh, maybe pesticide uh, applier to a data engineer of a farm. It's um, how can we get uh, people prepared for these different kinds of jobs that don't exist yet? in our future food system. Yeah. And since you alluded to it, Sabella, I, I'd love to give a plug uh, for DRIVE and the Future of Food Initiative. Uh, DRIVE is, the, is led by the Central Valley Community Foundation. And uh, we were fortunate to uh, work with partners at Fresno State University, our community college partners, uh, Merced College and Reedley College. And UC Merced is at the table as well uh, as a lot of other organizations, equity and justice organizations, uh, small farms, uh, UCANR, of course. Um, but we're all trying to um, create an inclusive and vibrant economy. And that Fresno to Merced Future of Food Innovation Corridor or initiative is really focused on how can we get the best ideas from the universities and put them into play in the industry. So that's part one. Part two is how can we provide opportunities for uh, small farms to have access to the necessary tech innovation that currently only big industry partners have access to. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, it's how do we have an engaged food system? Um, Hecho and Fresno is a, a component of developing food, um, usually in small organizations and providing a space where people can create things from our vibrant food ecosystem here. Um, and so thanks to Governor Newsom and our legislature, we have $30 million to get started with this potentially region altering um, opportunity. And I'm so grateful for it. Oh, thank you, Lee. Uh, I'm actually delighted to say that Sage is quite involved in the Etuan Fresno project. 
um, which will be a, a fabulous sort of food hub, market hall, aggregation center for small farmers, and a new sort of La Cocina in, in Fresno. There were so many wonderful questions here from the audience. Let's jump in there. So a number of people have asked you to please give some, um, your thoughts about food waste. Um, there's so much thrown out. What can we do there on food waste? Alice, do you want to start us, please? Well, I think the only way to really understand it is to be cooking yourself. And when you are, you're very aware of what you have used and what you have not used. And it's what got me to start my compost system is because I just couldn't bear it to waste food. And so if there was something that got over ripe or whatever, I could know that it was pulling down the, the carbon from, from up there. But once you, once you do that, um, you're sort of aware of the amount of food that isn't eaten. You're able to judge things accordingly. And I think when you're cooking for other people and you're sharing food, you make it go around. You, and it's something we've lost, the dinner table. We've lost the dinner table of sitting down. And it's just like we've been indoctrinated by the fast food industry that you know, more is better, time is money, you know, everything should be fast, cheap, and easy. And there's always availability. There's always more. And these are not true. It's not true. And yet we just act as if it is true. So we, we need to uh, learn at school. Again, I think public education is the place where we can learn not to waste, not to waste anything. And um, as I said, when you learn to cook, you, you learn to use the stems of the chard and <laughs> you, you begin to think about food as precious. And we have lost that idea that food is precious and that nothing should be wasted. But we have had that understanding since the beginning of civilization. We've always spent the most money on food. And we always, we never wasted it. It's only in the last, you know, 60 years that that has changed. And it's come through the indoctrination, advertising, and just this idea that it's, it's almost, um, again, more is better. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely, thank you. Um, I do invite you all to please put your questions in the chat and I'm kind of perusing this as we go. Um, Nancy reminds us that actually we, we were successful getting universal free school lunch in the budget this year. So huge thanks to you and, and um, others and Evans, Delane, your work on this over the, over the years as well. So thank you so much um, for all of that. Um, I think some people maybe sort of a penultimate question, they wanna ask, you know, what barriers are. So Sonia, when you look at your work in trying to, to research and promote regional food systems and more regenerative agriculture. Um, and then you're doing it as a researcher and proponent at, at SARAP. I mean, what do you need? What budget, what are the barriers that you see to, to adoption? Um, Is it marketplace driven? Is it more policy driven, research driven, all of the above? Yeah, I mean, all of the above, I would say. Um, and some, and as far as more like where I tend to focus my work is on the farming practices, and um, there it is true that factors like mechanization and scale, the large scale of farms, is can be a barrier. I mean, 
things like um, using cover crops in your orchards to where, where you're growing useful plants that improve the soil during the rainy season. I mean, a lot of growers don't want to do that because it may interfere with their mechanized harvest later on and things like that. So there's a lot of these kind of structural barriers that they do. I think there are solutions. I don't feel like they're insurmountable, but it does, it needs, um, various, sometimes it's technical approaches, sometimes it's policy approaches. I mean, a whole mix of them all, I would say. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things all of three of you touched on is the people in the food system. Very often we're sort of looking at outcomes and, um, but um, we have a lot of challenges in the people who work in the fields on one hand um, with wages and conditions and housing and, um, all that. And we also have huge precious people working in the food industry and in food service and restaurants and retail, very low wages in the Bay Area. The average wage is 64% below the kind of livable wage here in the Bay Area. So I'm not sure. Um, you know, I'd love your thoughts about what we can do to help um, support better, better jobs across the board. Um, I've got lots of ideas there too, but please, you all answer first. Well, I might just quickly jump in and say, I do get frustrated when I continually hear the argument that, well, we can't raise the price of food because then some people won't be able to afford it. This is true in our current system, but it's, you know, it's not within the food system that we need to fix that. It's in the broader society where it comes down to having living wages. Yes. I mean, the inequality in our society overall has grown hugely over the last several decades. There shouldn't be people making $10 an hour minimum wages. You know, it's so this is something that needs to be addressed in the larger society. I think it's not just that the answers all have to come from within the food system. So that's been a pet peeve of mine, I wanted to say. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I just sort of say, related to what we talked about earlier in the governor's budget is we need to make a connection between this sort of at the nexus of climate change, equity, and good jobs. And in fact, there are great jobs and great emerging jobs around climate smart agriculture. We need many more people who are on the ground, scientists looking at some of these metrics as we try to sequester carbon and have more biodiversity. So I think we've got some catch up there to do both in our data collection, and in our um, workforce development kind of promotion, because there are there are extraordinary jobs. We we Sage currently has a project with the community colleges called "100 Plus Jobs to Feed People and Sustain the Planet," and we're really excited by the number of different um, organizations we're working with and companies that are employing people that they would like. You know, who knew you could have a job of a director of culture and um, innovation and director of sustainability and fiscal. And so they're, they're really great jobs um, that are emerging that we need to support and need to track. Um, there's some very specific questions. Maybe this is for you, Sonia or Lee, um, you know, studies that look at how do we compare carbon sequestration in regenerative soils versus industrial farm soil. That's sort of a, a technical question, but I think it gets at maybe the broader question, which is, you know, we're no longer measuring agriculture just in terms of yields and productivity. We're measuring it in terms of how many birds are in the system, what are the wages, what is the carbon sequestration, and what is the water conservation um, practices and capacity of the soils in that environment. So, you know, maybe the question about soils is broader just when it comes to um, you know, how do we move towards a system which doesn't just look at yield and productivity as a single bottom line and, and it considers all these other elements? Do you want to well, jump on that, Lee? It looks like you're ready to go. Sure. And I think while Nancy um, pulls up my slides, thank you so much, um, uh, that I'll just mention that part of the solution is uh, that higher education, and we're part of the UC family, that higher education is a promise to elevate and uh, improve one's own life, one's family, 
um, uh, the we want to provide those opportunities for great jobs and um, it's so important and I know ARCS is invested in this but it's so important to change the face of the food system and because we need to have all of the diverse and experiential ideas that uh, we otherwise won't have. We won't have, and that's especially important with technology. Technology tends to be exclusive rather than inclusive. And so we need to have students that are coming from all over the uh, country to create empathetic solutions, um, uh, solutions that are based on um, the experiences that they've uniquely had, and it makes the technology and the food system better for all of us. Um, and I, just to your soil question, I wanted to share um, some of these pictures from the first day at our UC, Mer UC Merced Experimental Smart Farm. Here was the first soil sample, and uh, these two young women are uh, in the agroecology class. They are getting, um, Sorry, I just saw a, t a chat from my boss. <laughs> it's an instinctive <laughs> reaction. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I know Josh wishes he could jump in here, but uh, uh, but at the UC Merced Experimental Smart Farm, we had students working to get that first soil sample to let us know how much carbon is in it from a previously grazed landscape. And how much carbon will we be able to add to it? How long will it take? And maybe eventually California will have a wonderful carbon market in which we uh, will incentivize growers to save carbon in their lands. Next slide, please. This is just a picture of the setup of the uh, data stream for the soil moisture and uh, water and carbon are intimately tied together, but there's probes in the ground at multiple levels. Uh, the next slide, please. This is a graduate student who's holding a soil auger. And the last one is the one I wanted to get to. Um, the student on the uh, right is holding a soil auger, looking very majestic, the future of uh, farming, I'm hoping. And the student on the left uh, developed the uh, Arduino software to be able to stream the uh, earth breathing, basically to capture the gases that are coming into those little white thermoses, basically, and to be able to account for all of the um, air and what's in the air of the uh, soil. The earth breathing is how I think of it. Uh, mm. So. There's a lot of opportunities for um, soil in particular. I, I strongly encourage you all to listen. I'll share it in the chat of Dr. Asmaret Verhe, who's an advisor to Biden on uh, science and technology, uh, does a great TED talk on soil. And Thank you. Seymour said. Thank you, Lee, so much. And you know, I want to, again, thank you for being really the person envisioning the whole plan for the Merced, uh, for the UC Merced Experimental Smart Farm, which I know has been itself a bit of holding this tension between people who feel like agriculture is in the hand of the engineers and the folks who feel like agriculture ultimately needs to be almost approached with indigenous sensibility, really a, a 360 degree understanding of the environment, the soils, the water, not only in a rational way, but maybe also in a spiritual way. Um, we all need to connect. So I think the fact that you've been able to hold all of that as you've done your vision plan is, is really pretty extraordinary. Um, Sabella, just... I would like to ask you to recognize um, Delaine Easton, who has had her hand up and has a question. I am so sorry. I was not seeing hands up. I was just telling Delaine, welcome. So wonderful to see you. Please ask your question. You need to unmute, there you go. I need to do that. Thank you so much. I, the first most important thing I wanna do is to thank Sabella and Alice and Ann Evans who are on this call. When I was superintendent, we managed to put gardens in over 3000 California schools and neither governor, one a Republican, one a Democrat ever helped. But the peop these people, these three women, were m helped me to move the mountains with a lot of other great people all around California. And so I have to tell you, I really do believe what you're talking about here tonight is absolutely essential. It's so important. 
and it really isn't. And and I'm a graduate of UC Davis. I'm a graduate of UC Santa Barbara. I'm a machinist's daughter. My mother's a dress clerk. My education changed my life forever. But I was also educated about food. My grandmother in Kentucky used to say, I raised everything at this table except the salt, the sodi. <laughs> she was a farmer. She, my grandfather owned a sawmill, but she was an amazing cook. And my grandmother in, in my mother in California was from French ancestors. And so she was an amazing cook who uh, lived also in an Italian neighborhood. All this by way of saying, that this is really, I want to make sure we talk about how, what a conjunction this is between, yes, great education, kids that are hungry don't learn well. Yes, our culture, because food is absolutely a reflection of our culture. Nobody teaches this better than Alice in her books. Yes, it is a reflection of health. If I offered you a few billion dollars to improve student health or family health, one of the things we ought to be having a conversation about is food. The, these kids are eating, pardon my French, it's a technical term, crap, a lot of them. And yet I've been in schools where the, the kids said, I never liked salad. I used to eat salad, but I didn't, my mother made me, but I didn't like it. And then lean over in the garden and maybe it was in Berkeley, but maybe it was out in the Central Valley. Maybe it was up in Mendocino. Maybe it was down in San Diego. The kid would pull something out of the garden and say, I didn't like salad, but this arugula, this is wonderful. <laughs> this is a blue collar kid. And so I, I wanna just say, this is, yes, it's about learning, not only about helping our kids to be more well-nourished so they do eat, learn better, but also about learning about culture and life and joy. That's what you find at Chez Panisse. It isn't just some good food. It's people having fun, celebrating what they're sharing with one another. And so is the gardens that you share with your friends. So is the day you take your grandson out and he finds out, my God, I can't tell you how many people I've handed a persimmon to. I didn't think I liked persimmons, <laughs> but this persimmon is delicious. Well, they had a bad experience with, you know, when they were eight and they just never got over it. But I know so many people who didn't realize. And what I'm saying here is, yes, we need the intellectual investment. And yes, we need the research. And I su salute my wonderful University of California. But we need to engage every level of education from preschool to graduate school in reaching out and helping us to engage these kids. Because that kid that's living in the you know, back of a van or that kid that's living in a house with you know, five brothers and sisters, look, we're, there's a falsehood going on in California. They talked about how these kids during the for those of you who don't know, I was superintendent of schools of California, and I had a garden in every school initiative. We put gardens in over 3,000 schools, even though I had two governors that dragged their feet. But it's because of Alice. It's because of Sabella. It's because of Anne. And it's because of some of the rest of you on this call. Forgive me for not naming everyone. Bottom line is, this needs to be about celebrating life, about learning, about discovery, and also about the future of this republic. Because there are people on this call who grew up in marginal circumstances, but they got enough, enough, yes, nutrition, yes, love, yes, engagement. But, you know, I mean, some of us on this call had very modest gardens growing up as kids, but we remember the day. My dad used to go out and plant things. He'd plant, you know, different kinds of cher tomatoes so that we'd know the difference. And, you know, he, there were so many things. So I, I want to say to all of you, let's remember, this isn't just about the University of California. Every level of education in this state needs to be challenged, needs to be encouraged, needs to be invited to engage our kids, not just in good lunches. Uh, that's important. I'm not lying to you. It's really important these kids not eat this dead food that we pass off as school lunches but it's also about the kids learning the joy of growing and the joy of, of cooking. And thank you, Alice, because we, 
you know, again, I couldn't get any support from the governors. We produced a bunch of documents first, nutrition to grow on, then a child's garden of standards about how you teach the standards in the garden. Some knucklehead on the state board said, we don't need kids playing in the dirt. The, the governor at that time, Pete Wilson said, you know, that's something they should do after school. For heaven's sakes, a, a garden is a laboratory. Yeah. And I could go on, but I just want to say, we moved the needle such that we had gardens in over 3,000 schools. So it's really good <clears throat> cooking adventures going on. And, but it's, we've got to go beyond UC because there's no UC above Davis. So the kids in Humboldt will be left alone. Kids in Del Norte County won't have a chance. And yet there's great food, great opportunities in Napa, Sonoma, in, in Mendocino and uh, yeah, down in Brawley. Yeah, no, no question. Delane, thank you so much for all you've done and, and that perspective and, and those reminders. You know, um, maybe I, I will just add uh, just one comment here from the chat. Um, and Dig says, for those who are really interested in regenerative agriculture, there's a pretty, um, pretty dynamic new entity coming along called the Regen One, the Regenerative Ag Alliance, regenone.org, that's in the chat. Um, and I would like to invite our three panelists really to, to make final remarks, you know, especially remarks that are, that are to the beneficiaries of this great ARCS organization, the students who are going to be the researchers and undertake some of these incredible challenges and opportunities you've all outlined. So we'll start with you, Sonia, and then Lee, and then Alice. Just, just your final summary remarks, please. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks so much for having this event also. Um, I think just in summary, for especially for the science students, I would say, and I think what we've really, what Delane just said and what we've all been saying is, it really requires a lot of systems thinking. It's about everything. It's about the natural science and the spirituality and the economics and the culture. So we need to remember that just an education just in science is very powerful, but it's not enough. It has to be married with these other elements too to be really, truly powerful. Um, and yeah, just understanding that there are also many perspectives on what is really sustainable and people come with their own perspectives and a good scientist has to mediate between those and, and understand that there's different priorities out there and you know the science isn't the final word always. So uh, I'll end with that, but thank you very much for the opportunity here. Thank you, Sonia, thank you. Lee. Um, I just want to thank ARCS for investing in STEM, um, and STEM has agriculture in every aspect of it. Um, let thy food be thy medicine, you know, our engineering department is, uh, really focused on agriculture from a different perspective. And then of course, science and technology. So, um, thank you for including agriculture in your investments. Um, I think what I'm hearing from this conversation is that we are going to be changing our value for waste and trying to think of ways to close the loop. And I'm really inspired about that question. Um, and as this conversation gave me a chance to delve into Alice and Sabella's work, um, the Rumi quote that kept coming to mind was, and Delane touched on this as well, is uh, let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. And uh, I was thinking about my three-year-old daughter, how she climbs into the raised bed and balances on the edge of the two by four and chomps into the chives directly from the plant. <laughs> I hope we can all uh, find a way to kneel and kiss the ground um, and engage with food and friends and family in ways that we haven't been able to as much as we may have liked. It's foods communal and um, so thank you so much for this opportunity. Lee, thank you so much. That's a really powerful words here. Thank you. Alice. Yeah, I didn't realize how much my Montessori education would 
become so vital at this moment in time. She talked about the education of the census. She wanted to know how to teach children who were sensorily deprived because of hunger and poverty. How could they be educated? And she said that, that the senses are our pathways into our minds. So we need to, at all times, learn by doing, by touching, by tasting, by smelling, by listening very carefully, by looking very carefully. And I feel like people have been denied that experience and that schools need to become places of empowerment for students by allowing them to experience hands-on learning. They never forget. I just will never forget when I took Montessori training in London and we had to go out into Hampstead Heath, bring back the leaves, trace all the leaves and calligraph the name. And I know to this day, all the trees in Hampstead Heath. <laughs> That's such a wonderful story. And Sarah in the chat says, Merced has a public and free Montessori program. So that, that is pretty fantastic. And I can see the link now between the Montessori program and the experimental farm. I can see there's a direct I'm coming link. to visit. <laughs> so so welcome um, you all are welcome. <laughs> I wanted to, to, to want to come. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. So First of all, I would like um, to thank our fabulous audience for your attentiveness, for your wonderful questions, for your comments and uh, resources that you placed in the chat. So thank you so much. And I'm not sure I should do this, but I want to invite you now to unmute yourselves and give our extraordinary panelists a huge round of applause for their work and for their participation and inspiration tonight. So thank you so much. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. So uh, closing remarks there, Nancy or Jerry. Hey, Jerry, please. All right, I'm here. Am I there? Well, thank you so much for coming, um, being with us. Very much our thanks to Sabella and to Alice and me and Sonia, your remarks really give us hope for the future. And I also wanna add a very special thing. You see Merced is now part of our um, Northern California chapters uh, schools. Okay, so thank you all for joining the event. We're just yeah. waiting for that official word. The time, the time is right there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and free announcement. Uh, well, anyway, the point is, we also have another science events on February 10th at 5 p.m. It'll be all about twins and will come from the Stanford Twin Registry and will be presented by Dr. <laughs> Mark Davis, Director of Institute for Immunity, Transplantation and Infe Infection. So I, that concludes I mean, my, my, my thoughts. And thank you so much for coming. You've been a wonderful audience. It's just been a wonderful program tip panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Everything. Thank you all. Thank Good you. evening. Bye. Fabulous. Fabulous. Fantastic. <clears throat> wow. Thank you job. so much. <laughs> Sabella, you did a fabulous job. Alice. Oh, yes. Lee. Thank you. Oh, oh, yes, Lee. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I think you, you have a group of people here. In fact, we could have brought in most of the audience to also participate because I know in this audience, many of you um, are also incredible experts in so many parts of the food system and have huge contributors. So, um, you know, it's a great opportunity to sort of highlight some of the work of those three folks. And um, I think it gives us all a sense of hope um, that we're in this together and that there are positive solutions, there are tensions, but there's also the will to try to address, we just try to see a, a larger common, a collective 
good, um, even while they may be some sort of different pathways and approaches um, in food and agriculture systems. So. Is Delane still there? Is still with us, Delane? Big thank you to you, especially. I'm honored to have been here. I have nothing but admiration for all of you. And I, I really do mean it when I say we never could have done what we did if it weren't for the people on this call. A lot of you I didn't give a shout out to, but we have work to do here because there's a tendency to push us aside. You know, I, I'm disappointed that some of the press doesn't spend more time saying that state has this big surplus and education is the number what one happened? priority. And not one paper I have read have said that. I'm sorry, but that's what it ought to be. And that's what the state constitution says. Look at Article 16, Section 8. From all revenues, there shall first be set aside the money for the education of children. Mm. Think about it. It doesn't say about, you know, a bunch of other fancy stuff. And I'm sorry, I, I'm, I care about very much about so many other aspects of our mm -hmm. economy, but... Alice pointed out earlier on how far we've fallen. When I graduated from high school, you're all sitting down. I California was fifth of the 50 states in per pupil spending tied with New York. When I became superintendent, we dropped to 47th. I got us back to 27th. Mind you, I had to, I used to be taller. But <laughs> the fact is that right now we've fallen back down again. And here we are, this huge surplus, and yet the the education is not getting the money it should be getting from preschool to graduate school. I'm not trying to take anything away from the universities or the community colleges or from preschool. All of them need our attention because it's education that determines the future. I'm, I'm a machinist daughter. My mother's a desk clerk. I paid a lot more taxes than I, my brother did because I got this great education. And I know so many other people I went to high school with who had okay lives, but not the kind of wonder and joy that you get when you get an education. I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox again. Somebody <laughs> needs to burn it, but anyway. I'm so glad you could join us, Delane. <laughs> I'm honored to be with you. Go get them. You see, Davis. <clears throat> you gonna say that? Yeah. Well, thank you all. <laughs> we thank can you. really want to continue this, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for putting it together, guys. <laughs> it's dinner time. Yeah. Thank you for featuring Merced so well. I mean, this is really fun. And so. Jerry, thank you so much for putting wow. this together. Here, here. Thank you, thank you, Jerry DeVecchio. Yes, I thank learned you. so thank much. Thank you to Jerry. Thank you. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for coming. I think thank I'll go have a drink. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Good to see you all. Isabella, thank I am you. so grateful to you. Thank oh, you. it was fun, Jerry. We should do it again. Yeah. <laughs> I like with this number. 151 <laughs> people thank you, Jerry. attended. Let this be part one. That was wonderful. Yeah, thank exactly. You. I would. Hi, Margot. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Hello. I would agree. I, I would agree. M many more discussions. And you know, I think it's, it's great to have these kind of discussion sort of across hi oh, was that um, Amaral? Yeah. Amaral. yeah hi Amaral. hi Lori but it, it was to have this discussion sort of across these different sectors from you know focusing on education and on on the university statewide and on UC Merced as our newest UC and all that all that's happening out there it is very exciting to try to keep making these connections even while our heads are down and <laughs> often with more on our immediate plate than it feels like we can manage. Just being able to take the time to make those connections and look at some big ideas and other perspectives is so important. So I'm, I'm not sure who is officially, um, yes, uh, officially closing. <laughs> um, I don't like to do this, but I will end the Zoom. Because I will sit here all night. Have a That's true. <laughs> that is Thank true. you, everyone. Every Thank Hi. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank hey. you, Sabella. Bye. Thank, Thank you so much, Sonia. And